Hi there, and welcome back to this free online learning course, Is God Dead? This begins lesson three, exploring the key philosophers and their ideas that shape the Is God Dead discussion. The thinkers we'll discuss in lesson three include Rene Descartes, David Hume, Ludwig Feuerbach, and Karl Marx. All famous philosophers in their own right, each was invested in the topic of God and religion, and therefore shaped what will become the Is God Dead discourse. In order to better meet your needs, I'm presenting Lesson 3 as four distinct videos on YouTube. That way, each video will be much shorter, and those of you who are here to learn about one of these thinkers will not need to watch a much longer video. This part of the lesson discusses the French father of modern philosophy, René Descartes. Descartes is one of the most famous philosophers of all time, giving us Cartesian rationality, a fancy way of describing the system that many of us use to think and understand who we are in the world. He was a famous skeptic, turning his doubts about any and all truth claims into a formula for obtaining certainty about the world. More on that in a moment. But first, if you need to catch up on the previous lessons, click the link up top or in the description and you can find lessons one and two. Otherwise, let's dive in. To start learning about Rene Descartes, I'd encourage you to stop and think actually about two contemporary figures who aren't usually associated with each other or with Rene Descartes but they both help to exemplify Cartesian rationality. And the two figures are Joe Rogan and Rachel Dolezal, the no-nonsense podcast host and the white woman who swears she's black. To understand them is to understand Descartes. So let me pose this as a question. Have you ever wondered about the relationship between the word reasonable and the word rationalizing? In English, they're kind of paradoxical. On the one hand, we're supposed to make rational decisions and be reasonable, but whenever we get into trouble for being unreasonable, or whenever we have to defend ourselves for something we've done or thought, then it could be said that we're guilty of rationalizing. So what gives? Well, I recently showed my class clips of both Rogan and Dolezal participating in interviews. In Rogan's case, he was interviewing a vaccine scientist about whether or not the you-know-what vaccine was safe. I don't want to get into that here. What's important is that Rogan is confronted with scientific evidence during the interview, and he's skeptical of the evidence. The scientist is emphasizing, in the, in the interview, the scientist is emphasizing that Joe's perspective on the vaccine is wrong, and he shows evidence. Joe's response is to question where the evidence is coming from. He literally asks, well, yeah, but where's this from? Who's doing the study? Who are these people? Eventually, he pivots and concedes, never coming around fully to the scientist's position, but granting for the possibility that he's mistaken in whatever he thinks or, or believes on the issue. Now, instructive here are two points about Joe's behavior. First, his assertive refutation of experts. And second, his willingness to be convinced by new evidence. Cartesian rationality is on display in both moments. Where does a person get the strength and audacity to stand up to popular convention? This is a common Western masculine ideal, in fact, right? How can a single person trust themselves ahead of all the rest of the people? This is what great Western movies are all about, not even great... Western movies, great movies in general, Serpico comes to mind. This is such a common feature in the U.S. that many would wonder why anyone would trust a group above their own perspective. This is what Descartes is doing. Descartes wanted to understand the world and to know with certainty what he could know of the world. His famous meditations offer a thought experiment, specifically in the form of an evil genius deceiver, he says, who could be fabricating all of existence. Everything around Descartes could be a lie. How would he know? Cartesian rationality is the name we've given to Descartes' solution 
to this problem. Today, this is often thought about and talked about in terms of whether or not we're living in a simulation, but that's tangential to Descartes. Descartes argues that because he can doubt the things most foundational to his thinking, he can ground his ability to assess them in his basic ability to doubt. Why? Because he cannot doubt that he is doubting. And this philosophically, you know, existentially, and in so many other ways, is a brilliant, elegant argument. He's uncertain, he's scared, he has doubts, he cannot know with certainty anything about his experience or how he's processing that experience. And so he says, doubt, therefore, will become a way forward towards certainty. Of all the things that Descartes can doubt, he finally arrives at the realization that he cannot doubt that he is a thinking thing. By thinking thing, he means a thing that doubts and understands and conceives and affirms and denies and wills and refuses and imagines and perceives. This, this is how he understands what, is, what he calls the clearest and most distinct proposition he can trust with certainty. Now, this is a version of skepticism. Most of the time these days, we think of skepticism as an atheist position, but really it simply means a person doubts first when presented with new information. In the Rogan example, he's also practicing skepticism. Rogan is being a good rationalist when he refutes as a matter of course, a matter of method, his first instinct is to refute the new data that's in front of him. But the strength of his thought, Rogan's, is as significant here. Descartes famously concludes, I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum. This we remember as the cogito. And it's one of the most famous passages in all of Western philosophy. I think, therefore I am. At the end of all skepticism, I arrive at the truth of my own rational faculties. Truth, all of it, at all times, is filtered through the prism of who it is that I am. This perspective has more or less guided all of the modern Western world, so much so that Rogan's individuality is celebrated by millions. You know, in the, in the current cultural climate of polarization, Rogan is, is looked at as a beacon of rational deliberation. What does that mean? It means he's, he's able to navigate the I against all of the U's. And it's really, it's hard to underestimate the impact of Cartesian rationality on the Western world. And it's absolutely vital when we're thinking about what the death of God means or represents that we think about whether or not Cartesian rationality is still operative and in, in what way does it still matter for who it is that we understand ourselves to be. Think about Rogan. No external forces will dictate to him or any of us what we will, what we will or will not think about ourselves in the world. This is what Descartes is arguing and this is what is on display with Rogan. For better or worse, whether he's right or wrong, truth for him is filtered through him and out his mouth. We think for ourselves. This has been the cornerstone of the entire Western liberal enterprise. Now here I mean liberal, not in the political sense, but in a, the sense of a single individual subject who subsequently has acted as if we can solve all of the world's problems, but that's uh, neither here nor there. The important point right now is that, that liberal is in reference to the single individual subject. Cartesian rationality is the name we give to the software program that runs that single individual subject. Now, notably, we see Rogan change his mind based on different information, and that's important. But we don't see the scientists simply demand that Joe change his mind. Now, parenthetically, this rational deliberation is lost with many governmental policy decisions like 
shot mandates and the like. Uh, and therefore, those mandates frustrate people who are locked into this Cartesian system. I've referenced the vaccine at two or three times in this video. I really don't mean to talk about that content. It's more about the form that the debate has taken. Why are people upset? They're upset because I am the adjudicator of truth. A government, not, not a government, not a church, not anything is going to tell me what is true or what is right or what will keep me safe. So we're seeing both a shift away from that logic at, at the level of groups, but this logic dies hard if it's dying at all. Now, nevertheless, Joe does change his mind in the end or seems open to changing his mind in the face of new evidence. But any changes of mind will be determined by himself. And I could go on and on about a lack of awareness of how this operates for so many people in the West that ends up responsible for a tactical failure on the part of Democrats. But I digress. So I also said Rachel Dolezal demonstrates Cartesian rationality, you know, even if it might be of an irrational sort. So in the interview I show in my class, Dolezal is hit with every point of evidence the reporter can find, suggesting that the woman is not, in fact, black. In the face of each piece of evidence, she has a defense. You could say she has a rationalization for her claiming to be a black person. At one point in the interview, the reporter even shows a side-by-side -side of Dolezal's birth certificate and an image of her biological parents who are listed on that birth certificate. The woman responds by offering, well, you guessed it, skepticism about the authenticity of her own birth certificate. This is how badly she wants to claim a black identity. Now, one reason we know about this woman is because pop culture loves absurdity and her refusal to accept her own whiteness is nothing less than absurd, to say nothing of her training and professional position. But ironically, it is also an example of rationality. What I mean is that she's not thinking or behaving differently than Joe Rogan or Rene Descartes or any of us rational actors. Where it's different is the length to which she's willing to go without having her position changed by any outside pressures or evidence is, is longer than Rogan's on the vaccine or Descartes in some respects, or most of us on most, most positions. But the way that she's thinking about herself and the world is the same. The difference between something being reasonable and irrational is often only a matter of degree. This holds true for all sorts of things we believe, even up to and including God. And leading someone like Sigmund Freud to suggest that it is a collective neuroses. That is, it's, God is a delusion held at a collective level. But it's no different formally than Dolezal believing that she's black. So, And we could press that even further, psychoanalyzing it, in that there's something then happening for Dolezal that, that kind of requires her, that, that forces a need within her to claim that identity. Now, what that is, is between her and her therapist, and it's really none of our business, but it's instructive for us in learning about what, what rationality is. It's also worth noting that what we celebrate as a masculine virtue when Joe Rogan does it, you know, is fodder for criticizing Dolezal as merely rationalizing a belief that she wants to maintain in spite of the evidence. Now, some people criticize Rogan as well, especially on the vaccine point. We don't treat all rational actors the same, and this has roots going back all the way to who it is that was understood to be a rational actor at all. Her claiming that she is black is her positioning herself as amongst the population of folks who were last afforded the ascription of rational. It was, a, it, was a, it was a debate amongst these philosophers as to whether or not Africans and black folks in the diaspora even were rational, whether this fit with them. 
Same holds true for how they understood and thought about women. That's ironic. We'll get back to those kinds of ideas um, later in this lesson. This tension that I'm describing has led the philosopher Lewis Gordon to suggest that it is ultimately irrational to follow rationalism as far as it will take us. And again, what's reasonable or unreasonable is a matter of degree. That is, we decide based on feelings and opinions and hunches. There's nothing rational about who gets to count as rational. That's weird. Now, you might wonder why. Well, there's a problem with rationality. There's a logical problem, a philosophical problem. Cartesian rationality is inherently circular. And here's, here's why I say that. If your own uncertainty is necessary for you to find certainty, you become your own arbiter of truth. I mentioned that earlier. Nobody can tell you otherwise about anything. Now, this is as true of Rogan or Dolezal as it is true of telling an artist what color palette to use or convincing a narcissist to apologize. This is the result, ultimately, of something that's outside of the control of Descartes. This is something that's the result of what has been called the mind-body problem, as well as fueled the debate between what's called idealism and empiricism within philosophy. This gets to what the, the movie The Matrix is all about. Is the world where we find ourselves real, or is it a facsimile of some realer place? To this day, 2023, we simply still do not know. Hence, new theories about being in a simulation. Simulation theories are as old as Platonic idealism. But in terms of how we arrive at truth, we can know we are thinking, doubting things, and we place our trust in that, but we can't know more than that. David Hume, who we'll talk about next, will offer a way of better understanding this problem. So be sure to watch the video that comes right after this one. But in terms of truth, the buck stops with the cogito, the I, the thinking thing. So how then can we determine if you or you or you or any of the people or objects outside of myself are real? How can we know for sure? In short, we can't. At least not with the certainty that we want and that Descartes sets out to provide. We label Rogan reasonable when he shows a willingness to change his mind based on outside evidence. We label Dolezal irrational when she remains staunchly opposed to changing her position based on outside evidence. In Descartes' case, he turns to God to serve as a kind of bridge between the interior world that can be trusted and the external world. Descartes trying to decide if objects outside of his mind are real. He's a thinking thing, and he thinks other thinking things are real. But how can he be sure that everything he perceives is not simply a figment of his imagination or an imposition from some sort of evil genius? God matters because Descartes needs to not only establish that something else exists beside himself, but that that something is an objective reality. I need to know that you are real, as real as me. Descartes said that he saw plainly that the certainty and truth of all knowledge depended strictly on his awareness of the one true God. He says that in the fifth meditation. But how can he be sure that his idea of God or an objective reality is not also a figment of his imagination? So God comes in as the solution to his problem with determining whether or not other things are real besides his own rational faculties. But now he's forced to prove that, that God is real. He sets about to prove the... Ex and so he's... And so he sets about to prove the existence of God based on the following formula. Effects, he thinks, always need causes. His idea of God and of external objects are effects which require a cause. 
He's confident that he did not cause these things because effects cannot be their own cause. And so where would his idea of God come from, save from God? Where do our ideas come from? I ask my students this all the time and they look stumped. Why do they look stumped? One, because they haven't thought about it. And two, we don't know. Where do ideas come from? An idea carries a certain kind of gravitas, right? Not mass, but a something that can impact the physical world. Where do they come from? Anyway, Descartes creates a novel argument for the existence of God that blends parts of the cosmological and ontological arguments already established in history and discussed in lesson two of the course. Based on Anselm's famous idea of God as that than which nothing greater can be conceived, Descartes argues for God's existence, and as a result, he kind of becomes the father of modern philosophy in the process. He was a medieval philosopher, and all of a sudden he gets to kind of position himself as a modern philosopher. I'm not saying he did this willingly or knowingly, and that's kind of how it's received because of the way that on the one hand he retains God as as something to um, center reason and discernment and philosophy. But on the other hand, he jettisons, uh, you can think of it as dogma, the church rule, authority. Who is the authority in the end? Him. So here's how a, a famous contemporary thinker, Roger Scruton, explains Descartes' argument. So he says, since God is all perfect, he is no deceiver, from which it follows that those faculties that Descartes has innately will, when used in accordance with their true and God-given nature, lead him not in error, but towards greater discovery. God could not be self-deceptive. Scruton continues, I am an imperfect being, as is proved by the fact that I can doubt and therefore do not have perfect knowledge. But I have the ideas of a most perfect being of God. And whence came this idea? It could not be of my own devising, since it is manifest to the natural light of reason that there must be as much reality in the cause as in the effect. Applying this principle to ideas, it becomes manifest that there must be as much formal reality in the cause of an idea as there is objective reality in the idea itself. The more reality represented by an idea, the greater the reality that produced it. And therefore, my idea of God represents the highest degree of reality. Its cause, therefore, must be real in the highest degree. In short, I believe in God because of the reality of God. He's saying his idea of God is of a perfect thing. Consequently, this idea must have a cause. The cause can't be Descartes because the idea of perfection couldn't come from imperfection. And therefore, God must be the cause of the idea of God. And therefore, to Descartes' formal argument, God can then serve as the foundation of rationality. Based on this argument, modern philosophy gets its most popular idealist perspective in the form of Cartesian rationality undergirded by the idea of God, belief in God. God becomes the most true, clear, and distinct of all the ideas in my mind, Descartes said. And God comes to be thought of as the most central component of Cartesian rationality. God ends up the mechanism allowing the I to cross over and engage with the you. Ah, but here's the thing. I mentioned this at the beginning. This argument for God relies on an assumption that perfection is what we call an a priori attribute or a predicate of the object God. In terms of the classic definition of God, which is discussed in lesson two, perfection is an attribute of God. But in terms of our human experiences, we have no evidence to support this position. It's an argument that relies on insufficient evidence to draw a general conclusion. This, as Hume will tell us, is an induction fallacy. So Cartesian rationality, what is it? Well, it's a couple things at this point. It is technically a way of arriving at the truth, but it's also been so influential over the last several centuries 
And it's kind of like the water we swim in concerning how we understand the world and ourselves in the world. Now those waters are becoming increasingly turbulent. And as a result, we're forced to confront the circularity of Cartesian rationality. All philosophical reasoning relies on principles that can be proved only by arguments that presuppose them. For example, we know God exists because of clear and distinct methods of reasoning. What, what's on display for Rogan and Dolezal? These clear and distinct methods of reasoning for Descartes relied on God existing, but we don't have clear evidence that God exists. Now, this means we have to, a lot more to talk about as it concerns God, but it also means that God, we really ought not understand as the foundation of Cartesian rationality. So what is, you might ask, who is? Well, some of you might have guessed it. You are. I am. Joe Rogan is. Rachel Dolezal is. The thinking thing, the individual thinking thing, is the foundation of modern truth. Truth is organized around whether or not we hold something as true. Evidence and experience do help to shape our perspectives on truth, but so does belief and intuition and hunches and preferences. And as we'll find out in the next section of lesson three, David Hume considers this arrangement to be both a problem, but also an eventuality based on how the human mind works. So with that, I thank you for your time and attention. If this video has been of value to you, please take a moment to hit the like button. If you want more of the content, consider subscribing and stay tuned for future lessons in this free online course, Is God Dead? Thanks so much. We'll see you in the next video.